Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Thursday night study in the Psalms and we are in we are in Psalm 81 and we are in part 2. We're looking at the rabbinic commentary, the Midrash to Helim 81 and I uh, I titled the study again, is it enough to merely ask the Lord God to save us? Okay. And so um hopefully I follow through with that theme in part 2. Because that's the same title for part one. But um, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful time that we can gather together and study your word. Thank you, Lord, for the freedoms to be able to study your word. And Lord, we ask that tonight as uh, we read about the psalm and about the rabbis, that you would speak to our hearts, you'd help us to live our lives to bring glory to your name. We pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so... We're on part two. I posted a link in the room, and uh, if you go to that page, and then you can download the study, the PDF study, and it says part one and two. And I am down on page 10. And so the rabbinic commentary, uh, Midrash to Helim on Psalm 81, has seven parts. And as I read through the Midrashim, I think we'll talk about part one, part three, four, six, and seven. Those seem pretty interesting. And so, uh, down on page 12, I outlined the Midrashim in a typical fashion, as you can see on page 11 and 12. Okay. And so, Midrash to Helene 81, part 1, it opens with the Dibor Hamathil, the opening phrase or word, and it says, For the leader upon Gitith, a psalm of Asaph, sing loud unto God our strength, shout unto the God of Jacob. Okay, so the rabbis are looking at Psalm 81, verses 1 through 2. In the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states that these words are to be considered in the light of what Scripture says elsewhere, none that behold iniquity in Jacob. Okay, so the Petitha, the homiletic introduction, it states that singing and giving praise to the Lord is to be interpreted based upon the statement in the Torah that no iniquity has been observed in Jacob. And when we think about that, that should immediately remind you of the Torah portion um, with regard to um, Balaam and Parashat Balak. And it should bring to memory what uh, Balaam had said concerning Israel. And he said in Numbers chapter 23, verse 21, He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. Okay, And not only does the Torah state in Parashat Balak uh, that iniquity is not observed, he also states that there is no weakness seen in Israel. Okay, And when we think about that, you know, how can this be said about Israel after all the times that they had rebelled against God? And anyone have any thoughts on that? How, how can... You know, because Balaam was speaking under the inspiration of the Lord. And so, you know, and he said that there is no iniquity observed in Jacob, and nor was there wickedness seen in Israel. And so how, how can that be? In the Masoretic text, it states that uh, none have beheld Aven in Jacob. And that Aven is iniquity and have not seen perverseness or mischief in Israel. And the word, when we, when we look at the, the Hebrew text, that the word uh, perverseness or mischief may be translated as calamity. And thus, because God me, remains on the side of Israel, there is not found any gross injustice or iniquity in Israel. And although Israel may have sinned and may have been disobedient to God's word, because there was justice, the people did not indulge in immorality. The Lord God remained on their side. And this is the basic premise that falls out of the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and the apostolic writings. And the rabbis have the following comments concerning uh, Numbers chapter 23, verse 21 in Parashat Balak. And um, I, when looking at this, it's always, it's always interesting to see what the rabbis have to say. And... You can see here on page 13, it says, According to Shnei Luchot Habrit, 
Vayeshev Miketz Vayigash Torah Or 289 and 290. Okay, and so it looks like it's um, a Torah commentary on Parashat Vayeshev Miketz and Vayigash. And um, so we're looking at part 289 and 290, and it says the following it says, Berachot 7 discusses the brief span of God's anger based on Bilam's comment in Numbers 23 8 that he. The expert at timing God's moods had been unable, because of God's anger at the time, to find the opening to make a curse effective. Tosafot asked what good it would have done Balaam to pinpoint that anger, seeing it only lasts a rega, a moment, and the length of time it takes to utter the word rega. And they answered that all Balaam had to say was kulam, destroy them. By reversing the word kulam to into melech, that a king, if you spell kulam backwards, it means melech, that the curse was converted into a blessing. And this is the secret of the expression. Uh, it says that it says that the Torah melech bo in Numbers twenty three twenty one, of which Balaam speaks. Okay, and then that was that was part two eighty nine and two ninety. It says, David also alludes to the repentance which we will perform when we experience persecution. According to Azri, uh, Arizal, the letters in the word Teshuvah, repentance, are the first letters of the words. Um, and I, I list a bunch of words here. Or it, the, mid, uh, the, the commentary list is a bunch of words here. You can see on page 13. And one can recognize a person's penance by observing these five manifestations of remorse. In our psalm, the same idea is alluded to by the words, um, and you see the whole list of words there as well. And um, ta'anit is the ta'anit is alluded to by the words the uh, azrani sameach samecha, and you you girded me with joy, parallel to Kohelet chapter nine verse seven, eat your bread, and uh, joyfully. Okay, so the Talmud, and we see that in the commentary that uh, they mention the Talmud Bavli Berachot 7a. They said it says 7 in the commentary, but it's 7a when I looked that up. And it discusses the briefness of God's anger and points to Balaam's words on the length of time that God is angry with his people. The rabbinic commentary states that repentance is observable as five manifestations that demonstrate remorse, which then leads to God's forgiveness and cessation of his wrath. Now Rambam, in his book, The Guide for the Perplexed, has the following to say, and you can see on page four, on page 13, I, I quote from The Guide for, for the Perplexed on Numbers 23, verse 21. And Rambam says, In a similar manner, the Hebrew habit, or hibit, signifies he viewed with the eye. Compare look, tubit, not behind thee, but his wife looked the tabet back from him, and if one looked the nibat unto the land, and figuratively to view and observe with, in, with the intellect to contemplate a thing till it be understood. In this sense, the verb is used in passages like the following, He hath not beheld hibbet iniquity in Jacob, for iniquity cannot be seen with the eye. The words, and they looked the hibbet to after Moshe, in addition to the literal understanding of the phrase, were explained by our sages in a figurative sense. According to them, these words mean that the Israelites examined and criticized the actions and the sayings of Moshe. Compare also, contemplate, habit, to pray the, the heaven. For this took place in a prophetic vision. This verb then, when applied to God, is employed in this figurative sense, to look at Mehabit unto God, in the similitude of the Lord shall be behold Yabit, and thou canst not look Habit on iniquity. Okay, so they they give a a various number of uh, references to different scriptures in the Torah, and um, in the prophets there's there's one uh, from Habakkuk, and so Rambam states that the stain of sin cannot be seen with the eye, and that the explanation is in agreement with Rashbam and Rashi that um, the phrase that 
Torah Melech Bo stems from the word for friendship or companionship, as opposed to the literal translation of horn or trumpet of the king in him. The idea is of God forgiving Israel's sin follows nicely with the explanation of God being Israel's friend or companion. The alternate interpretation from Rashban is that the Lord God hasn't seen Israel's sin since the last time Balaam tried to curse Israel. And this leads back to the understanding on the limits of God's anger and the greatness of his mercy and grace. Being blessed the last time, since, since nothing has happened from since then, there is nothing for the Lord to allow a curse to come upon them. And um, the explanation from Rashbam is simple and direct. And so basically that Rashbam says that um, what is going on with regard to Balaam's words on Numbers, what was that, Numbers 23, 21, was that um, the, was to look at the time frame within which God, um, these words were spoken, that there was a, there was a certain amount of time that had occurred and that it, that is why uh, Balaam said, and you know, God speaking through him said that um, I see no iniquity in Israel, and there's no weak or no iniquity in Jacob. There's no weakness in Israel, and um, and so um, now the entire midrash it says the following. So I quote all of midrash to Hillel 81 part one. It's really short, and you can see that on page page 14, and it says the following. I'll read the whole thing. It says, "For the leader upon Kitith, a psalm of Asaph." Sing aloud unto God our strength. Shout unto the God of Jacob. These words are to be considered in the light of what Scripture says elsewhere. None that behold iniquity in Jacob. Why did Balaam choose to mention Jacob and not Abraham and not Isaac, but only Jacob? Because Balaam saw that out of Abraham had come base metal, Ishmael and all the children of Keturah. And he also saw that out of Isaac there had come Esau and his princes. But Jacob was all holiness, for to his sons all these are the twelve tribes of Israel. Scripture says that you are all fair, my love. Hence, Balaam mentioned no patriarchs other than Jacob when he said, None has behold, beheld iniquity in Jacob. So too Asaph said, seeing that there was some base metal in all the patriarchs except Jacob, in whom there was no base metal at all. I too will mention only Jacob. Hence, shout unto the God of Jacob. Okay, so the rabbis they use an interesting comparison, and they they talk or they compare Isaac to base metal, but the children of Israel, or sorry, the children of Isaac, Jacob and Esau, was a product of two types. One as a pure, that was holy, reference to holiness, and the other that was dross, that was full of iniquity. Now it's for this reason. The Midrash concludes, and it says, So too Asaph see, said, seeing that there was some base metal in all the patriarchs except Jacob, to whom there was no base metal at all, I too will mention only Jacob. Hence, shout unto the God of Jacob. And so the reason that Jacob is mentioned is because in him were all the twelve tribes of Israel. We don't find him producing other children like you find with Abraham and Keturah and Ishmael and uh, Isaac with regard to Jacob and Esau. You know, there was, um, they had children that were um, impure in a sense, I guess, because uh, they were full of sin. Now, um, let's see here. The rabbis argue, oh, okay, here, um, let me come back up here. The reason Jacob is mentioned here is because in him were all the twelve tribes of Israel, and the Lord loves all of his people. And this is why Asaph wrote, according to the rabbis, hence shout unto the God of Jacob. And so, um, yeah, I had talked about there how um, Jacob was the only one who didn't have children that, you know, that uh, were, I mean, I guess you, know, you look at how the children treated Joseph, right? But um, they were considered pure and holy. Okay, so that concludes part one of the Midrash. Now, Midrash Tehillim 81, part three, it opens with the Dibur Hamat heel, and it says, Take up the melody and sound the timbrel, the sweet harp with the psaltery. Okay, and they're, they're looking at verse three of Psalm 81. In the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it says, Rabbi Chaya, son of Abba, taught the psaltery and the harp were the same. The rabbis argue that the psaltery is different from the harp. 
And it says in, in verse 2, Raise a song, strike the trim, timbrel, a sweet-sounding lyre with the harp. Now, the psaltery of ancient Greece is a harp-like instrument. You know, we're always reminded of the angels, you know, on, on clouds and with harps. It's like a Greek thing. And the etymology of the word psaltery is taken from the ancient Greek uh, psalterion, meaning stringed instrument, a psaltery, a harp. And it's from the verb solo, meaning to touch sharply or to pluck or to pull or to twitch. In the case of the strings of the musical instruments, to play a stringed instrument with the fingers and not with a plectum. And the psalterion, and I'm getting all this information from the Greek from a Greek lexicon. You know, if you're wondering, um, you can find uh, lexicons online. You know, easy. You can search for words and stuff. Um, the psalterion was originally related to the solo to touch sharply, to pluck, or to pull, or to twitch. And solo came to mean making music in general with any instrument or to sing with or without their accompaniment. And the psaltery branched off and became an instrument on its own belonging to the family of stringed instruments. And the psaltery was originally made from wood and relied on natural acoustics for sound production. And in the King James Version, psaltery in its plural salt trees are used to translate several words in a Masoretic text, such as Keli in Psalm 71, verse 22, and in First Chronicles 16, verse 5, Nabal, and in First Samuel chapter 10, verse 5, Second Samuel 6, verse 5, and I list a bunch of verses here. And um, and the point is, is that if you look at the English translation, you'll find that these Hebrew words are translated as uh, psaltery or salt trees. And the Aramaic pesetarian um, is also translated as psaltery in the book of Daniel. And so why do you think the rabbis take the time to point out the differences between the psaltery and the harp? What do you think? You know, what is, what's going on here with the Midrash? Well, I quote the entire Midrash on page 15. You see there, and it's really short again. And so let me read through it. Midrash Tehillim 81, part 3. Take up the melody and sound the timbrel, the sweet harp with the psaltery. Rabbi Haya, son of Abba, taught the psaltery and the harp were the same. Rabbi Simeon taught the psaltery was one thing, the harp was another. They differed one from the other in the number of their bass and treble strings. Rabbi Huna said in the name of Rabbi Asi, nor did they differ only in the number of their bass and treble st strings, for the skin of the sounding board of one of them was not dressed. And why was the psaltery called Nebel? Because it put to shame every other kind of musical instrument. Rabbi Judah said in the name of Rabbi Eli, how many strings will there be or will there to this psaltery? Seven, as is said, with seven a day do I praise you. In the days of the Messiah, however, there will be eight strings to the psaltery, for it is said, for the leader on the Sheminith, the eighth string. And in the time to come, the psaltery will be made with ten strings, as it is said, upon an instrument of ten strings upon the psaltery. Okay, so that was the conclusion of the Midrash, part three. And so the Midrash points out specifically that the differences between the psaltery and the harp is in the number of their bass and treble strings. And Rabbi Huna said that they also differed in the skin of the sounding board where one of the instruments was not dressed. The reason Nabal was used, or is translated as psaltery in 1 Samuel 10.5 was because the instrument put to shame all other instruments. The number of strings is said to be seven because uh, with a seven a day do I praise you. They then say that in the days of the Messiah, however, there will be eight strings, for it is said for the leader on Shemineth, eight strings. And then, uh, so the question is, why do you think the rabbis say that in the days of the Messiah, there will be eight strings to the psaltery? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Why do you think that is? And I felt that this may be the theoretical groundwork for the rabbis to suggest the prophetic nature of the Psalter in the Psalmster, in which he discusses the higher order of prophecy, that of the Nevi'im, and the utterance of the Holy Spirit as manifest in the Ketavim, in the writings of the, of the Tanakh. 
Both sections of the Tanakh foretell the future, but with different characteristics. In addition, the number eight is actually a unique Jewish concept that describes a man as having the ability to transcend his nature. And um, the number seven symbolizes the complete purpose of the human existence, combining the spiritual level of the Shabbat with the physical effort of the week. You know, we get six days of labor and the seventh day we rest. As we go beyond the seven, the number eight symbolizes man's ability to transcend the limitations of the physical existence. Therefore, the gematria of eight, the chet, represents that which is on a plane above nature. For example, the metaphysical divine. And our praying to the Lord God in heaven, in hearing his voice, etc., would be the um, that, you know, moving from the seven to the eight. And the rabbis believe that the study of Torah and the practice of its commands are the ways by which Israel can strive to exalt human human spirituality towards the realm above the natural. You know, so we're, we find that you know, transition from seven to eight. And this is emphasis is highlighted in Midrash Rabbah Vayikra, Parashat 10, Part 6. And um, Ellie says there are seven notes in a musical scale, seven is perfection or completion, eight is the new beginning, Asian Messiah. Yeah, this is good. And uh, Rocky asks, can you explain what you said about the metaphysical divine? Um, what I meant by that was that um, with regard to uh, our ability to hear from God, you know, hear the Lord speaking to us in our spirit, you know, and so um, when when we talk about the metaphysical divine, we're not talking about our becoming divine or anything like that, but it's um, in relation to it, it, it's a way of trying to describe, at least the way I tried to approach describing how or why the rabbis are using the gematria basically here in the midrash to reference to the seven strings and the the psaltery, and then in the age, the day of the age of the Messiah, there will be eight, and so there there's something more. You know, and like Ellie says, eight is the new beginning, the age of the Messiah. You know, there's something more when the Messiah is in our midst. You know, it, it we we find the um, this this kind of Torah concept of God being in our midst as well, and we're actually hearing and speaking to Him face to face. And um, but um, that that's kind of what I meant by the divine or the metaphysical divine in the sense that to try to describe that we have the capability of hearing from God, you know, and um, him speaking to us by his spirit. And uh, now in the, the emphasis that is uh, highlighted on these things is found in Midrash Rabbah Vayikra, Parashat 10, Part 6. And I, I quote from this on page 15 and 16. And it says, and it's quite a bit here. It says the following. It says, in the garments, Rabbi Simon Simon said, even as the sacrifices have an atoning power, so too the priestly garments atoning power, as we have learned in the Mishnah in Yoma uh, 7, 8, part 8. The high priest uh, officiated in eight garments and an ordinary, ordinary priest in four, namely in a tunic, breeches, a mitre, 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 and a girdle. The high priest wore, in addition, a breastplate and ephod, a robe, and a headplate, the tunic to atone for those who wear a mixture of wool and linen. It is said, and he made him a coat, a tunic of many colors. The breech is atoned for unchastity, um, literally the uncovering of nakedness, since it is said, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover the flesh of nakedness, since it is said, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover the flesh of the nakedness. Um, the might, mitre atoned for arrogance, since it is said, and thou shalt set the mitre on his head. The girdle was to atone, some say, for the crooked in heart, and others say for thieves. Uh, Rabbi Levi said the girdle was thirty-two cubits, and he, the priest, wound it toward the front and toward the back. And this is the ground for stating that it was to, it was to atone for the crooked in heart. So the numerical value of lev, you know, lam and vav, is heart is thirty-two. The one who said the girdle was to atone for thieves, though that inasmuch as the girdle was hollow to bear 
resemblance to thieves uh, who do their who do their work in secret the breastplate atoned for those who pervert justice as it is said and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the ephod was to atone for idol worshippers since it is said and without the ephod or uh, teraphim as for the robe Rabbi Simon said in the name of Rabbi Nathan um, said for two things sins there is no atonement yet did the Torah provide atonement for them namely unintentional manslaying and evil speech and the Torah provided means of atonement how is it atoned for by the bells of the robe since it is written a golden bell and a pomegranate a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the skirts of the robe round about and it shall be upon Aaron to minister the sound thereof shall be heard the implication is, let this sound come and make atonement for the other sound. There is no atonement for one who unintentionally slays a human being. But the Torah provides a means of atonement. How does he t obtain atonement? By the death of the high priest, as is said. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return unto the land of his possession. The forehead plate was to atone. Some say for the shameless. Others say for blasphemers. He who said... For the shameless deduced it from the daughters of Zion. It is written here of the forehead plate, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead. While there it is written, Thou hast a harlot's forehead. Thou uh, refused to be ashamed. He who said the forehead plate was to atone for blasphemers derived it from the case of Goliath, uh, who blasphemed. Here it is written, and it shall, always, shall be always upon his forehead, there, in the case of Goliath, it is written, and the stone sank into his forehead. Okay, so um, the idea that seems to be put forward here in the Midrash is that the high priest had eight vestments. Okay, so that, that's where we get the number. That's how we get the connection here. Because <laughs> I'm sure as I was reading through that, you're like, huh, All right? But um, the, the, the idea is that the high priest had eight vestments that were made especially for him. And the regular Kohen, however, only wore the first four vestments when he did the service in the Mishkan, the shirt, the pants, the sash, and the hat. And the eight vestments enabled the Kohen Haggadol to enter into the Holy of Holies, and so the number eight symbolizes the man's ability to transcend the limitations of physical existence by entering into Hamakom, into the place, the throne room of God, our Father in Heaven. And so the uniqueness of the eight vestments emphasized the Kohan's mission as a representative of the nation. The garments are said to have also served as an atonement for specific sins that the nation had transgressed collectively as a group. And the rabbi's conclusion saying that in the days of the Messiah there will be eight strings to the psaltery suggesting that when the Messiah is here, the world will be lifted to a greater spiritual state, being closer to God our Father. And this is a very close parallel to what we have today in Yeshua the Messiah as a result of the presence of the Messiah in our lives and his continual ministry before God in heaven. Okay, and then neat. And so um, Midrash Tehillim 81 Part 3 concludes... And in the time to come, the psaltery will be made with ten strings, as it is said, upon an instrument of ten strings upon the psaltery. And so, and they quote from Psalm 92, verse 4. And so, if we follow along under this line of thinking, we can conclude that in the world to come, in the Olam Haba, or the time to come, let le, le Atid Leva, you know, and that there will be ten strings where we move beyond the eight and the nine, and we go to ten. And this may be representative of being in the very presence of God face to face. And um, Ellie, did you have comments? Did you, want, did you want the mic? Is that where your hand was up? Let me know um, before I continue here. Oh, okay, okay, that's an accident. Okay, so that concludes part three of the Midrash. Now, um, or the Midrash, uh, Midrash uh, to Halim 81. Part 4, it opens uh, with the Debor Hamad Hill saying, Blow the trumpet at the new moon and at the full moon. In the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states that these words would be considered in the light of what Scripture says elsewhere. Blessed is the people that knew the trumpet sound. 
They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. Okay. And so here, the command on blowing of the trumpet is parallel to knowing God and walking in the light of God's countenance. And this idea comes out of the Torah text based on the following comments from the rabbis and according to the Midrash. And they say that blessed is the people that knew the trumpet sound, a generation of the wilderness knew by the sounding of the trumpet when to pitch camp, when to journey forward. As is said, make two trumpets of silver and you will use them for the calling of the congregation and for the journeying of the camps. Accordingly, the end of the verse, they walk, O Lord, in light of your countenance, is to be read in the light of the words. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Okay, so the idea here is that the trumpet sound was meant as a guiding sound that led the people in the wilderness. The generation of people, the children of Israel who were delivered from Egypt, were led by the hand by God himself. And the trumpet represents the movement of the Lord, the pillar raising up or setting down, which indicated the Lord God leading the people in the wilderness. And in, in the Midrash, we're given another interpretation. And it says the following, it says another comment, the words, blessed is the people that know the trumpet sounds, refer to the people who in, intercalate the year and designate the day that is the proper day for the sounding of the trumpet. And the words, they walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance, means, according to Rabbi Abahu, that the Holy One, blessed be he, conforms to the calendar of the children of Israel. Oops. Okay, so the concept set forth here is that the trumpet sound is designed to order the days and the seasons and the moedim. And a faithful person will order his days or his or her days for the purpose of drawing near, walking in righteousness, living in holiness, which is separating oneself from worldly activities, and doing justice, helping the poor and the widows. And so, um, and, and you know, listen to that again, you know, because it says that um, the concept of the trumpet sound is designed to order the days, the, se the seasons, the modim, and that the parallel is to the faithful person will order his or her days for the purpose of drawing near to God, walking in righteousness, living in holiness, and doing justice and helping the poor and the widows. The further interpretation according to the Midrash is as follows. It says, in a different interpretation, the words are read, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound, that is, blessed are the members of the Sanhedrin who know the joyful sound of the give and take of Torah study. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. The Holy One, blessed be he, conforms to their decisions and makes their faces shine with the radiance of the law. Rabbi Josi said, son of Jacob, taught in the name of Rabbi Edi, who taught it in the name of Rabbi Aha. The verse, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He gives words of a horn, means that when the children of Naphtali were on a mission of Torah, they were as swift as the hind, and the words of a horn refers to the fact that the words of Torah were given to Israel with shouts of joy and with the voice of the horn, as is said, and all the people perceived the thundering and the lightning. The voice of the trumpet and the mountain smoking Hence it is said, blow the trumpet at the new moon. Okay, so the sounding of the shofar brings to memory the giving and the taking of, uh, you know, the, the Torah at the mountain of Sinai. And the rabbis say that it's the, uh, also a reference to Torah study. I think that might be a typo there that I have there in the document. And this is connected then to walking in the light and the countenance of God. And note how the Midrash states that the light of the countenance of God conforms to the decisions of men and makes their faces to shine with the radiance of the Torah. And the rabbis are saying that studying Torah is connected to the decisions that we make. And the blowing of the shofar with regard to the remembering of the glory of God standing before the mountain of Sinai, receiving his Torah and living for the Lord God in heaven. And the concept here is on the importance of studying God's word helps us to remember it and to live by it. And notice what Yeshua said in the apostolic writings in John chapter 15 verses 6 through 11. He said the following, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, 
and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples, just as the Father has loved me. I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Okay, so the Midrash states that Naphtali was on a mission of Torah. And notice the parallel here in Yeshua's words, remaining in the word, doing the Father's will, abiding in the loving of God, and keeping the commandments. This sounds a lot like a mission of Torah. You know, it sounds like that's what Yeshua is teaching. Obeying the commandments leads to both Yeshua and our joy being made full. Now, uh, Midrash Tehillim 81 part 4, it concludes and it says, In a different exposition, exposition of blessed is the people that know the trumpet sound. Rabbi Josiah said, But the nations of the earth, had they not many trumpets too? Had they not many bugles? Had they not many horns? But blessed is the people that know the trumpet sound refers to Israel, the people who know how to propitiate their creator, creator with their shouts of joy and with the voice of the trumpet, as when the walk, they walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance, in the ten days between New Year's Day and the Day of Atonement. Okay, so um, the shofar is connected to remembering the Moedim, which embody the power and the might of God. And observing the Moedim is connected to remembering the power of God to deliver. And thus we shout with joy at the voice of the trumpet because this is accompanied with our remembering the Lord God in heaven, his mercy, and his power to save us from all things. And you know, it, what um, something I didn't write down here, but I just thought about that when we think of a trumpet, we think of the shofar. And how many nations use the shofar as a trumpet? Do you know of any nation that uses the shofar of a trumpet? I don't know any. And uh, the rabbis mentioned here bugles and horns and, and stuff like that. But um, what I see here is when in the use of the shofar, you we are reminded so significantly of what happened at the mountain of Sinai, you know, and the giving of Torah and the reminding of how God, with a mighty hand, delivered us. You know, and so uh, when I think of uh, the horn, I think of the shofar because it's connected not only to the Moedim, it's connected to the Torah, it's connected to the ways of God, and then those things, um, that that is the way we are called to live our lives. And the shofar reminds us of God's ways, and His ways are to walk in righteousness, to love justice, and to show mercy, and to take care of the poor and uh, the widow and so okay so that concludes part four of the midrash to healing 81 now part six and we're on page uh, 18 part six opens with the debor hamat heel and it says when it is a statute for israel it is an ordinance of the lord of the god of jacob okay so we're looking at verse five the homiletic introduction to the midrash it states therefore what is not a statute for israel is not if one be permitted to speak thus in ordinance of the God of Jacob. And uh, the entire Midrash, it's pretty short. And so on page 18, let me read through the whole thing. It says, When it is a statute for Israel, is an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Therefore, what is not a statute for Israel is not, if one be permitted to speak thus in ordinance of the God of Jacob. And so Rabbi Hoshaiya taught when an earthly court decrees saying today is a new year's day the holy one blessed be he tells the ministering angels rise up the bima summon the advocates summon the clerks for the court on earth has decreed and said that today is new year's day if however the witness of the new moon are delayed in coming or if the court has decided in uh to in intercalate the year and to advance New Year's Day to the next day, the Holy One, blessed be He, tells the ministering angels, remove the bima, dismiss the advocates, and dismiss the clerks, since the court on earth has decreed and said, tomorrow is New Year's Day. And the proof? When it is a decree 
for Israel. It is an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Rabbi Phineas, uh, Rabbi Pinchas, right? Rabbi Phineas and Rabbi Hilkiah taught in the name of Rabbi Simon. When all the ministering angels gather before the Holy One, blessed be He, and say, Master of the Universe, what day is New Year's Day? He replies, Are you asking me? Let us, you and I, ask the court on earth. And the proof, when it is decreed for Israel, it is an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Okay, so that concludes the um, part six. And so the introductory words are compared in the introductory words. Let's see. When is, when it is a statute for Israel is an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Okay, and so we're looking at that. The introductory words are compared to the earthly court that decrees today is the new year. M, that the Lord God in heaven speaks to the angels to raise up the dais, the, the bima. And the bima is the pony, podium that's located in the center of the sanctuary. And the Torah is read from the bima. And some of the prayers are led from there as well. The podium is covered with a special covering to give honor to the Torah that will be read on it. And during the high holiday season, the bima cover and the covers of the Torah scroll the cloth, the cloth covering the cantor's podium and the, and the uh, curtain for the ark are all traditionally exchanged for one of white fabric. White represents purity, forgiveness, and a clean slate, which are, which are all central high holiday themes. The Midrash states to call out the witness and the sky is observed to see if the moon was sighted to decide whether the new year is beginning. On the other hand, if the new moon is not sighted, we are told that God, God tells the angels to remove the bima. The point, it seems, of the Midrash is that there are some rulings that God has established for men to decide upon, such as the exact day beginning the new year. And this suggests this is suggested at in the conclusion when they said it says Rabbi Phineas and Rabbi Hilkiah taught in the name of Rabbi Simon. When all the ministering angels gather together, the Holy One, blessed be He, said, Master of the universe, that day is New Year's Day. He replies, Are you asking me? Let us, you and I, ask the court on earth. And the proof, it is a decree of Israel, is an ordinance of the God of Jacob. And so, and that concludes the Midrash. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that it seems like um, the consensus here in part six is that God gives man a certain amount of leeway for interpretation and he he allows us to produce halacha on the way in which we um we obey him and he doesn't give us all the details you know i mean he gives us the scriptures and we have what the rabbis say but he doesn't give us all the details and so um it, he, the lord gives us a certain amount of autonomy in order to um, choose to do what is right and to, to walk in his ways. And so uh, that concludes part six. Now part seven, it opens with the Debor Hamat heel, and it says, In the verse he appointed it Samo in Jeho Jehoshaphat for a testimony. And they're looking at verse six. And read not Samo, but Semo, his name. Now the homiletic introduction states, Je that is the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, in Jehoseph, Jehoseph testified for Joseph that he had not touched Potiphar's wife. Okay, so this Midrash is pretty short. I list it on page 19. I'll read through the whole thing. And in the verse, he appointed it Samo in Je Jehoseph for a testimony. Read not Samo, but Semo. His name, Je, that is the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, and Joseph testified for uh, Joseph that he had not touched Potiphar's wife. The end of the verse, when he went out through the land of Egypt, implies so our masters taught that pardoned on New Year's Day, Joseph went out from his prison. For the next verse reads, I removed his shoulder from under the burden of sin. And in Psalm 81, verse 7, and what is meant at the end of this verse by the words, his hands were delivered, from the pots, they mean that he was delivered from being a servant to the chief of the cooks, for dude is read as in the verse, and he struck it upon the pan of pot, you know, dude. 
And the rabbis quote the phrase delivered from the pots as meaning delivered from the servitude in Egypt to prove that Joseph's children were not enslaved in Egypt. For the verse, he, his firstling, Bullock, majesty is his, means that like the firstling Bullock with which no work is done, as it is said, you will do no work with the firstling of your Bullock. So the children of Joseph were not enslaved in Egypt. That the pots, the dude, clearly refers to servitude in Egypt is indicated by the verse in the land of Egypt. When we set by the flesh, plot, flesh pots, a word rendered duda in Aramaic Targum. Incidentally, the proof that the children of Israel, when dismissed from work, go to their houses, used to pilfer food from the marts of Egypt, comes from the verse, Remember the fish which we were, we were wont to eat in Egypt for not. On the other hand, the verse, When we sat by the flesh pots, does not imply to the children of Joseph. They were not enslaved, and they sat not by the flesh pots, for they were shield bearers and warriors, as another verse says of them, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows. Hence it is said of Joseph, I removed his shoulder from under the burden. Okay, so that, that concludes uh, part 7 of the Midrash. And um, if you go and you look on page 18 or 19 of the study, you'll see that they give all kinds of scripture verses. I just kind of uh, keep reading on and skip that, but you might want to look up all their, their proof texts, texts for uh, what they're saying. But... Um, it's interesting to note that how the Midrash opens. It says, Edut Yehosef Shemo. Okay, saying that the Lord set his name or appointed it as a testimony to Joseph. And Joseph's name is spelled with a letter He, suggesting how the Midrash is to be interpreted. The testimony is in the Yod He, with the you know, Yah, which is a circumlocution for the name of God, the Yod He Bav He that the Lord places upon Joseph. And the rabbis take note that is not he appointed or placed, but instead his name is set as a testimony in Joseph. And the proof text is that of the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, Joseph did not touch another man's wife. And this is connected to what we read earlier of the study of the Torah, is connected to the decisions that we make and remembering the glory of God, standing before the mountain of Sinai and receiving Torah and living for the Lord God in heaven, etc. The rest of the Midrash speaks of proof text, texts regarding Joseph and his children not being slaves in Egypt. The parallels here are to obey the Torah and being set free and not being slaves in Egypt. Egypt represents sin, idolatry, adultery, and all the rest of the sins of mankind. And in the apostolic writings, we're told that Yeshua gives us the gift of the mercy of God, His grace, to facilitate the overcoming of sin in our lives or to not be in bondage. The mercy or grace that we have in Yeshua remo removes the guilt, stain, and the penalties for our past sins. And with a clear conscience and a clean spirit, spiritual slate before the Lord, as a result, in Yeshua... The past baggage of sin does not weigh us down, and so we are able to move forward under the power of God's Spirit and to walk in accordance with His Torah. And an illustration of this is to that of a runner who trains wearing a backpack filled with rocks. You know, and um, like uh, rocks could represent sin. And once the weight of sin is removed from his back, his legs feel as if they're flying through the air. I don't know if anyone's ever trained that way, but um, I've done that before. You know, even weightlifting, you know, in that your arms feel light, you know, your legs feel light. And um, in a similar manner, our faith in and love for and continuing abiding in Yeshua is key to receiving the empowerment to walk a life that mirrors Yeshua's life, as you know, we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. The Apostle Paul invites us to imitate Yeshua as he himself imitated Yeshua in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. And by following in the footsteps of Yeshua, abiding in him, in his word, and in the commands of God, these things cause our decisions to change and to be in line with what the Lord would want for our lives. When we abide in God's word and in Yeshua the Messiah, we will naturally produce good fruit where love 
is the first and foremost fruit out of which all the other fruits subdivide. And so the question is, how do we walk in love towards God and love towards our neighbor? And the answer is simple, by keeping his Torah command, which show us how to love both God and our neighbor. Paul said it very concisely, love is the fulfilling of the Torah law in Romans chapter 13. And this seems to be the point of the Midrash, where Midrash Tehillim 81 part 7 concludes saying, Hence it is said of Joseph, I removed his shoulder from under the burden. When we believe in the Messiah Yeshua, in the Lord God in heaven, and seek to live according to the commands, the Lord removes the burden of sin from our lives. He sets us free and empowers us to live for the Lord and for his glory. Amen. Right? And so um, that concludes the, the psalm study on the, the uh, rabbinic commentary. And so let me close with the word of prayer and I'll open the mic if anyone has any comments here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the works of your hands, including the work you are performing in our lives today. We glorify your holy name. We ask for help, strength, and the resolve to live for you with the confidence to know that you are present in our lives. We thank you for the promises you have made in your continuing faithfulness. Help us to keep our feet on the path of righteousness and truth according to your word and also to have the desire to walk in your ways. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua the Messiah and for always calling our hearts back to you. Please have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Yeshua, that we may enter into the covenant of peace that you have promised to your people. Help us to grow in our faith to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name and give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Anyone have any um, comments? I'll release the mic here for a moment.